Look, I'm a moose. Okay, I think we're back here. Let's double check. Oh, we still haven't done that. And there we go. Okay, we are good. And uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you might be on the world, uh, on the globe. And yes, it is round. And no, it's not flat, but let's not spend a lot of time arguing that. I think most of us solved that one a while ago. Um, but the, the gift of the internet is that there literally is no idea so stupid that you can't find several thousand people on the internet who'll go like, I always thought that too. Um, you know, folks, being able to find a few thousand people on an internet, international um, web of information that is literally available to billions does not make something true. I hope we've got that now. Um, I could sit here every day and say, I am the greatest writer who ever lived. And who knows, I might even find a few dozen blinkered souls who would say, yeah, you know, Dickens, Shakespeare, um, you know, Chinua, Achebe, and you know, all those other people, they, they're nothing. Jane Austen, puh, you know, Tad, Tad's the dude. You know why? Because he's got dragons in his books or whatever. That would not make it true. You can always find people to agree with you, no matter how crazy. We used to say that when I lived in Berkeley years ago, um, that no matter what weird thing you were into, if you walked around Berkeley and you read enough of the, the sort of handbills that were stuck up on telephone poles and walls, you could find a bunch of people who were into the same crazy crap that you were. Didn't matter what it was, you know, whether you like to make balloon animals and have sex with them. You know, it, it didn't matter. You could find people in Berkeley who would also be into it. And the internet is like Berkeley writ hugely large over the whole world. So flat earthers, just leave me out of your conversations. There's a lot more important and interesting things to speak about than trying to explain to you the elementary physics of a, a spherical planet. It's just not really worth our time. Anyway, sorry to get off course because I actually do have several things I need to talk about. Um, so the first one I want to mention is that uh, several people um, tweeted my dear and fabulous wife, Deborah, um, because she's on Twitter more than I am, saying essentially, um, we're trying to comment and we can't comment. Um, and I suspect I have now found why that is, which is that I had to go in and adjust one of the secondary 
sources to say public where I thought I'd made everything public and I'm not sure though if that's true. So if you're one of the people who has been telling Deb that, you know, I'm still having a trouble commenting, do me a favor tonight and try and comment and see if I've fixed it. If not, I'll try something else. Um, but so that was the first thing. What was the second thing? Oh, the second thing. First, before the second thing, I'll actually make the second thing the third thing because I want to explain why the second thing is particularly satisfying. So skip that for a moment. The third thing is it's been a very rough last few weeks. Um, again, not asking for any personal sympathy because it's not the kind of thing that anybody doesn't go through. Lots of people go through all of this stuff, but we're just having a, 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 a what's the word I'm looking for? A confluence of different events all going on at the same time. My, my mom's in the hospital um, with some pretty serious problems. As a result, my dad, who's quite frail, is home alone. So the brothers, we've all been taking turns and some of the sisters-in-law going taking turns to go over and help out. And uh, my brothers and sisters-in-law and Deb have all been huge and great about doing that. So, cause you know, we, we don't want to leave dad alone while he's, you know, while all of this stuff is going on. And, you know, now that mom's not there. So that's been going on in the midst of, you know, remodeling stuff for various reasons and a lot of craziness that comes from that, like having all the exits from the house painted and then not being able to leave the house and, you know, having to get the dogs out several times a day, but trying to fix the fences that Johnny kept going through and all kinds of other crazy stuff. So it's been a slightly, I'm only mentioning a few things, trust me, I'm not going to go into all the details of all the normal life crises that are going on because they're just normal life crises um and everybody's gone through them or is going through them you know or will go through them at some point all these kinds of things um but anyway so that's the second thing i was going to say is just that there's been a lot of stuff including family health issues and two of our kids moving out and then they immediately got covid as soon as they got to their new place so we've been worrying about them and blah 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 so it has been a somewhat um What's the word I'm looking for? Fraught. It has been a fraught couple of weeks and uh, very, very busy. But the reason I mention this is because I still can get, even in the midst of all this stress, and in fact, maybe more so because of various stress issues, I can still get huge amounts of pleasure out of comparatively small things. Um, I need them, in fact. And so today, in the course of doing research on various things, I discovered two things that made me really happy. That won't mean much to anybody else, but I found out that there is a really good source of fire kindling material in the heart of pine trees, which have fallen down. And it's called either pine heart, or it's sometimes called fat wood. And I didn't know this. So this I came about through doing research. Um, and it fits so perfectly with something that I needed to do. And I needed to find a way to make it happen that um, I just thrilled. It's like, Okay, now I know how that chapter is going to work because it's a book thing that I needed for Navigator's Children. And um, now that I've told you what it is, when you get to the very last few 10 chapters or so of Navigator's Children someday, you may remember this and go, oh, pine heart or fatwood or whatever term I'm going to wind up using. Oh, yeah, I remember him talking about that. Well, the other thing was, and this is completely pointless and has nothing to do with the Navigator's Children or anything else remotely work related, but I was um, trying to come up with, as I often do, another nickname for Dog Johnny, who is, as you know, is the mopiest damn dog in the world. Lovely dog, but has an unfortunate tendency to get out. And when he's not getting out of the house, he's moping. He mopes about everything. He's very nervous. He's a worried dog. Um, one of our other dogs is actually kind of going through a health crisis or, or our other dog at this point, we're down to two. Uh, our Chihuahua is going through a bit of a health crisis. He's epileptic and he's kind of sliding in and out of seizures a lot. So we're, you know, taking him to the vet and trying to deal with that. But every time he goes into a seizure, when anybody comes near him or even kind of these semi seizures, when anybody comes near him, he makes these horrible squealing, squeeping noise, <coughs> you know, like this. Um, like you're hurting him. I mean, it's the sound you'd hear if somebody was whacking him with something, but it's nobody's touching him or else if they are, they're gently trying to lift him down some stairs or something. But it's part of the process, part of the pathology, I guess, of how he's feeling the poor thing. Um, but Johnny, 
hates it. You know, as far as Johnny, Johnny cannot see, look at Walter the Chihuahua and say, you know, he's okay. It's just these, he's upset or scared or whatever. And he's making these noises. So every time he starts making these noises, which sometimes are for virtually no reason, or he'll try to reach down and pick some food up off the floor and uh, and that will cause him distress somehow, either pain or just don't know. But, um, and then he'll start these noises and Johnny just panics. Big dog Johnny, who's like 20 times Walter's size, gets all panicky and either comes and jumps onto one of us and starts whacking our faces with his giant paw to let us know, as if we hadn't noticed, that Walter is letting out these, these doom shrieks or else, you know, he wants to get out and he'll go to the nearest door if it's closed and just start scraping his claws down it, you know, and you're going, Johnny, please stop. Johnny, it's okay. Johnny's a... <laughs> Meanwhile, in a house that we're trying to get ready to have a praise. Anyway, so why did I start this? Oh, yes, I remember. So I was trying to think today of another name for Johnny because I'm frequently naming all the animals over and over again and giving them nicknames and whatnot. And I was realizing that although Johnny's behavior is a lot like Eeyore's in this kind of, from Winnie the Pooh, um, Eeyore's kind of grumpy sadness, sort of enjoying his own misery, that Johnny is, unlike Eeyore, is actively afraid of things, which is in fact, if you know the Winnie the Pooh stories, is much more piglet-like. So I was trying to come up with a German nickname for him. I don't know if we're going to have any German speakers on tonight, um, on the you know listening to the show, but um, the uh, so I was trying to think of you know so I was going what Schmerzhund, which would be pain hound or pain dog, and then I I looked up piglet in German because um, it's not a word I had come across. I know Schwein obviously is German for pig. But piglet is actually ferkel, F-E-R-K-E-L. And I realized that's what I have. I have a ferkelhund. So Johnny is ferkelhund. And um, that just pleased me inordinately. These, these small things that get me through the, the, the difficult times. So anyway, I'm in a very good mood about fatwood and ferkelhund. Um, so was there anything else I was going to mention? No, just the usual. I mean, it's... I'm. We're doing okay. None of these things are things that are out of the ordinary. Certainly COVID and, and aging ill parents and, you know, all this other kind of stuff is just par for the course for being human, um, especially these days. So um, nobody has to say, oh, you know, hope this or, you know, sending you best wishes. I, I appreciate that. I know that, you know, you are a kind lot of people because for some reason I tend to have very kind-hearted readers. I don't know if it's something in the kind of things I write or just the kind of readers who make themselves known to me, maybe more social and friendly and kind-hearted or whatever it is. But I've always had, I've always said this, I have very, very seldom, if ever, met anybody um, who's a reader of mine that I didn't feel comfortable with. Um, who I wouldn't feel comfortable being stuck on a butt bus next to for a long bus ride, which is, you know, for me, that's a major mark of success. Um, you know, for somebody who guards his privacy and his thinking time so strongly. Um, yeah, I, 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 I've always thought, wow, I'm really lucky. I have really nice readers. But anyway, so I don't even remember how I started all this, but that's basically... Um, what's been going on. So you, I'm not asking for sympathy or anything because as I said, everybody goes through things like this or will go through things like this particular. It's just, there was a Robert Heinlein story called The Year of the Bounce or The Year of the Big Bounce. I can't remember which one it was, but which basically was about a guy, a sort of early computer scientist who had discovered that these waves of like weirdness and natural disaster, these things that would occur in, in, in intervals through human history, like plagues, and earthquakes and sunspots and all this, um, we're all going to coincide at the same time. And basically it was going to destroy civilization. And he was trying to warn people about this, that these all these things were going to happen. So that's been what it's been feeling a bit. None of these things are particularly out of the ordinary, but they've all been coming on at the same moment. Sick dogs, parents with issues needed to be helped out and stuff and things and all that. So um, it's been a, it's been fraught. Anyway, 
that said, and again, reminding it, if anybody tuned in late who um, is had trouble um, commenting in the past, please try it tonight and then let me know if it didn't work. I think I found out what it was and I think I solved it, but I'll need to um, find out, get some feedback to see if that's true. Okay, before I start reading El Buco de Dragon Bono Chero, I am going to just run down the line here and see who has checked in. And I see Lori, good evening to you. Lori says, Mr. Williams. Well, you're a, you're a Williams also, Lori, so you can just call me Tad. And uh, who else? John White, hello, good to see you. Kelly, good evening from Northern Alberta, Mr. Tad and the Tadsters. Um, good to see you, Kelly. Claudia, hello, good evening. Barb Ann, good evening. Nice to see you too. Jared, hello, hello. Hope everyone there is feeling better than last week. Um, it's it's always a movable feast, I'm sure, not just for me, but for all the people watching. Um, but that's also a good reason to get together and hang out, you know, sometimes even if it's virtually, is just to remind yourself there are other people out there, they're all going through stuff too. Um, you know, it's, 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 it can feel like a lonely time when you're going through things. So it's good to hang out with other people and be reminded that, you know, we're kind of all in this together. Anyway, so thank you, Jared. Pierre, hello, hello. There's you. And Ron, hello, hello. Good to see you, Ron, my friend. Always a pleasure. Um, yes, the home improvements are doing great. Well, you can't see anything in here because this is the last room that's going to get fixed up in the sense that it's going to get clean top to bottom and it's become kind of a repository for things being moved out of all the other parts of the house because except for my desk, I don't need to use most of the space in here. Um, so you can see there's, it's a goodly long room. I think it, before we moved in, I think they'd actually made it into a separate apartment for, to rent to people. So there's quite a lot of space, but because of that also, it's whenever anybody has something they don't know what to do with, whether they're tools or boxes of stuff, you know, it's just like, well, we'll take it down and put it in the office. There's plenty of room down there. And as a result, well, you can see the, um, the table behind me, um, which was supposed to be my large book table because some of my books are quite good sized. You know, I have some big giant map books and art books and architecture books that I use as research. So when Deb was going to work down here, and that's why the table is here, but then she decided not to, and I said, well, just leave the table, and I'll use it as my, you know, laying out the really large books that are too hard to try and squeeze onto the desk. And instead, it's just been piled on. So that's kind of true for the whole office. So, um, But I'm not suffering as much as probably the cat is, um, since it's where she lives. Anyway... I have no idea why I was babbling about that, but, uh, oh, Ron was talking about the improvements. Emily, hello, hello. Good to see you. Oh, good. I'm glad you're feeling a little better. And your hardcovers are on a truck. Uh, hardcovers of your book. Okay, excellent, excellent. Good, good sess to you, as we say. Good luck. Dale, hello, Dale. Good to see you, too. Hiya. Um, John says something kind, which if I share, then I will just be patting myself on the back. Angie, hello, good evening. Yes, I'm going to be reading in just a couple of minutes. And I am going to say hello to Greg, another one who is up in Alberta. And good evening to you up there on the prairies. And I hope the, uh, the, the weather is nice and um, you are enjoying it now before the snows come. <coughs> I think I told you I lived for part of a year with a Saskatoon family, which I know is not Alberta. It's Saskatchewan, but um, they were living here in this area with me um, in California, and they were so prairie. It's like, and I probably told you this story, but like in October, um, which in California, October is one of the nicest months of the year. It's, you know, 70 degrees, it's, you know, autumnal, but in a really nice way, you know, it's warm in the daytime, it's cool in the evenings, the trees are turning, you know, it's beautiful. Um, I got married in California in October because we knew it would be good weather. Um, anyway, this family that I stayed with were lovely people, and, um, they were basically, as soon as October came, they basically weren't going to leave the house anymore in California. So they were like, okay, you got to get out to cards now. And I'm like, guys, it's 
70 degrees outside. People are walking around in shorts, going out to get ice cream. Or, no, no, October, time to get the cards out. And that was it. <laughs> Basically, would only go out, you know, in cars for the rest of the, the winter, which was pretty funny. But lovely folks, and I learned a lot from them. Who else have I not said hello to yet? I said hello to John. I said hello to Angie. I said hello to Greg. Yes, Greg was the last. Neil, hello. Is it fixed, Tad? I don't even remember what we were talking about then in terms of it being fixed. Um, but whatever it is, it's probably not fixed um, because nothing is fixed. Everything is in constant chaos and confusion, but that's okay. Tim, hello, hello. Good to see you. Alexis. Thank you for the kind words, Alexis. Good to hear from you, sweetie. Angie said, oh, Angie, I already said hi to, but Angie is sending kind words uh, for my family. So thank you for that. Um, and good to see you. What else? Chris, hello. Chris Vandal, good to see you. Um, Emily already said hello to Felina. Hello, hello, and happy Sunday. Cliff, good to see you too. I hope you are doing well. And... Oh, you took your kids out to a musical. Yeah, oh, based on the Jack Black movie. Yeah, I didn't know that, that that had been made, and I certainly didn't know it was Andrew Lloyd Webber. Excellent, excellent. Um, oh, and Jonathan Ehrman, Jeremy's brother, was there too. So, excellent, excellent. Very good. Okay, so with all of that said and all of that caught up more or less and things explained and all that, I am going to go back to the book, and we are actually starting Chapter 11 an unexpected guest. And it's it's funny because even though this is a later paperback reprint, uh, you know, not just paperback, but what, what did we used to call these? The, um, oh God, I've gone blank on my publishing terminology already, but the, the large format paperbacks. Um, the, you know, everything else is just the same. So the, the fonts and everything are so familiar. Anyway, chapter 11. An unexpected guest. Middling afternoon on the last day of Avril, Simon was sunk in the stable's dark hayloft, comfortably adrift in a scratchy yellow sea, only his head above the dusty billows. The hay dust sparkled down past the wide window as he listened to his own measured breath. He had just come down from the shadowed gallery of the chapel where the monks had been singing the noon rites. The clean, sculpted tones of their solemn prayers had touched him in a way that the chapel and the dry doings within its tapestried walls seldom did, each note so carefully held and then lovingly released, like a woodcarver putting delicate toy boats into a stream. The singing voices had wrapped his secret heart in a sweet, cold net of silver. The tender resignation of its strands still clutched him. It had been such a strange sensation. For a moment, he had felt himself all feathers and racing heartbeat, a frightened bird cupped in the hands of God. He had run down the gallery steps, feeling suddenly unworthy of such solicitousness and delicacy. He was too clumsy, too foolish. It seemed that he might, with his chapped scullion's hands, somehow mishandle the beautiful music, as a child might unwittingly trample a butterfly. Now, in his hayloft, his heart began to slow. He buried himself deep in the musty, whispering straw, and with his eyes closed, listened to the gentle snorting of the horses in their stalls below. He thought he could feel the almost insensible touch of the dust motes as they drifted down onto his face in the still, drowsy darkness. He might have dozed, he couldn't be sure, but the next thing Simon noticed was the sudden sharp sound of voices below him. Rolling over, he swam through the tickling straw to the loft's edge until he could see down to the stable below. There were three, Shem Horsegroom, Reuben the Bear, and a little man that Simon thought might be Towser, the old jester. He couldn't be sure, because this one wore no motley and had a hat that covered much of his face. They had all come in through the stable doors like a trio of comic fools. Reuben the bear swung a jug from a fist as broad as a leg of spring lamb. 
All three were drunk as birds in a berry bush, and Towser, if it was he, was singing an old tune. Jack, take a maid up on the cheery hill. Sing away, oh, hey, yo, oh, half a crown day. Reuben handed the jug to the little man. The weight overbalanced him in mid-chorus so that he staggered a step and then tumbled over, his hat flying off. It was indeed Towser. As he rolled to a stop, Simon could see his seamed, purse-mouthed face begin to wrinkle up at his eyes as though he would cry like a baby. Instead, he began to laugh helplessly, leaning against the wall with the jug between his knees. His two companions tromped unsteadily over to join him. They sat all in a row like magpies on a fence. Simon was wondering if he should announce himself. He didn't know Towser well, but he had always been friendly with Shem and Reuben. After a moment's consideration, he decided against it. It was more fun watching them unsuspected. Perhaps he would be able to think of a trick to play. He made himself comfortable, secret and silent in the high loft. By Saint Mirfath and the Archangel, Towser said with a sigh after a few sodden moments had passed, I had sore need of this. He ran his forefinger around the lip of the jug, then put the finger in his mouth. Shem Horse Groom reached to him across the smith's broad stomach and took the jug for a swallow. He wiped his lips with the back of a leathery hand. Where will you go, then? he asked the jester. Towser vented a sigh. The life suddenly seemed to drain out of the little drinking party. All stared glumly at the floor. I have some kinfolk, distant kinfolk, in Grinfod at the river's mouth. Mayhap I will go there, oh, though I doubt they'll be too happy with another mouth to feed. Mayhap I'll go north to Naglamond. But Jaws was gone, said Reuben, and belched. I gone away, added Shem. Towser closed his eyes and bumped his head back against the rough wood of the paddock door. But Joshua's people still hold Naglamond, and they will have sympathies for someone chased out of his home by Elias's churls. Even more sympathy now when people say that Elias has murdered poor Prince Joshua. But others said, others say that Joshua's turned traitor, Shem offered, rubbing his chin sleepily. <laughs> the little jester spat. In the loft above, Simon, too, felt the warmth of the spring afternoon, the drowsy, dragging weight of it. It lent the conversation below an air of unimportance, of distance. Murder and treachery seemed the names of faraway places. During the long pause which followed, Simon felt his eyelids creeping inexorably downward. Mayhap. It be not such a wise thing to do, Brother Towser. Shem was speaking now, skinny old Shem, as gaunt and weathered as something hung in a smokehouse. Baitin' the king, I mean, that ye need to sing such a golden song. Ah, Towser scratched his nose busily. My western ancestors, they were true bards, not limping old tumblers like me. They would have sung him a song to curl his ears up rightly. They say that the poet Aeonic Cluius once made an anger song so mighty that all the golden bees of the Grandspog descended on the chieftain Gormbatha and stung him to death. That was a song. The old jester leaned his head back once more against the stable wall. The king? God's teeth, I cannot stand even to call him such. I was with his sainted father, man and boy. There was a king you could call a king. This one is no better than a brigand, not half the man that his father John was. Towser's voice wavered sleepily. 
Shem Horsegroom's head slowly fell forward onto his breast. Reuben's eyes were open, but it was as though he looked into the darkest spaces between the rafters. Beside him, Towser stirred once more. D did I tell you, the old man abruptly said, did I tell you about the king's sword, King John's sword, Bright Nail? He gave it to me, you know, saying, Towser, only you can pass this on to my son Elias, only you. A tear winked on the jester's furrowed cheek. Take my son to the throne room and give him bright nail, he told me, and I did. I brought it to him the night his dear father died. Put it in his hand just the way his father told me to, and he dropped it. Dropped it! Towser's voice rose in anger. The sword that his father carried into more battles than a bratchet has fleas. I could scarce believe such clumsiness, such disrespect. Are you listening, Shem? Reuben? Beside him, the smith grunted. Tist! I was horrified, of course. I picked it up and wiped it with the linen wrappings and gave it to him. This time he took it with two hands. It twisted, he said, like an idiot. Now, as he held it again, the strangest look passed over his face, like, like, the jester trailed off. Simon was afraid he had fallen asleep, but apparently the little man was merely thinking in a slow, wine-addled way. The look on his face, Towser resumed, was like a child caught doing something very, very wicked. That was it, exactly, exactly. He turned pale and his mouth went all oh, slack and he handed it back to me. Bury this with my father, he said. It is his sword, he should have it with him. But I, he wanted it given to you, my lord, I said. But would he listen? Would he? No. This is a new age, old man, he told me. We do not need to doubt on these relics of the past. Can you imagine the thundering gall of such a man? Towser searched around with his hand until he found the jug and lifted it up for a long drink. Both his companions now had closed their eyes and were breathing hoarsely, but the little man paid no notice, lost in indignant reverie. And then he would not even do his poor dead father the courtesy of placing it in the grave himself. Wouldn't, wouldn't even touch it. Made his younger brother do it. Made Joshua. Towser's bald head nodded. You'd have thought it burned him to see him hand it back so, so swift. Damn puppy. Towser's head bobbed once more, sank to his breast, and did not come up again. As Simon came quietly down the hayloft ladder, the three men were already snoring like old dogs before a fireplace. He crept past them on his toe tips, kindly halting to stop her, the jug, lest one of them knock it over with a sleep-flung arm. He moved out into the slanting sunlight on the commons. So many strange things have happened this year, he thought as he sat, dropping pebbles into the well at the center of the commons yard. Drought and sickness, the prince disappeared, people burned and killed in Falshire but somehow none of it seemed very serious. Everything happens to someone else, Simon decided, half glad, half regretful. Everything happens to strangers. She was curled up in the window seat, staring down through the delicately etched panes at something below. She did not look up when he entered, 
although the scuff of his boots on the flagstones announced him clearly. He stood for a moment in the doorway, arms folded across his breast, but still she did not turn. He strode forward and then stopped, looking over her shoulder. There was nothing to see in the commons but a kitchen boy, sitting on the rim of the stone cistern, a long-legged, shock-haired youth in stained smock. The yard was otherwise empty of anything but sheep, dirty bundles of wool searching the dark ground for patches of new grass. "'What is wrong?' he asked, laying a broad hand on her shoulder. "'Do you hate me now that you should stalk away without a word?' She shook her head, briefly netting a stripe of sunlight in her hair. Her hand stole, stole up to his and grasped it with cool fingers. No, she said, still staring at the deserted acre below. But I hate the things I see around me. He leaned forward, but she quickly pulled her hand free and lifted it to her face, as if to shade it from the afternoon sun. What things, he asked a measure of exasperation creeping into his voice. Would you rather be back in Merriman, living in that drafty prison of a place my father gave me, with the smell of fish poisoning the air of even the highest balconies? He reached down and cupped her chin, turning it with firm gentleness until he could see her angry, tearful eyes. Yes, she said and pushed his hand away, but now she held his gaze. Yes, I would. You can smell the wind there, too, and you can see the ocean. Oh, God, girl, the ocean? You are mistress of the known world, and yet you cry because you can't see the damnable water? Look, look there, he pointed out past the Hayholt's walls. What is that? What, then, is the kin's law? She looked back with scorn. That is a bay, a king's bay which waits passively for the king to boat on it or swim in it. No king owns the sea. Ah, he dropped onto a hassock, his long legs splayed to either side. And the thought behind this all, I suppose, is that you are prisoned here too, eh? What nonsense. I know why you're upset. She turned fully away from the window, her eyes intent. You do? she asked, and beneath the scorn fluttered a tiny breath of hope. Tell me why, then, father? Elias laughed. Because you are about to be married. It is not surprising at all. He slid nearer. Now, Miri, there's nothing to be afraid of. Fengbalt is a swaggerer, but he's young and still foolish. With a woman's patient hand at work, he'll learn manners soon enough. And if he doesn't, well, it would show him a fool indeed were he to mistreat the king's daughter. Miriamel's face hardened into a look of resignation. You don't understand. Her tone was as flat as a tax collector's. Fengbald is of no more interest to me than a, a rock or a shoe. It's you who I care about. And it's you who has something to fear. Why do you show off for them? Why do you mock and threaten old men? Mock and threaten? For a moment, Elias's broad face curled into an ugly snarl. That old horse and sings a song that as much as accuses me of doing away with my brother. And you say I mocked him? The king stood up suddenly, giving the hassock an angry push with his foot that sent it spinning across the floor. What do I have to fear? he asked suddenly. If you don't know, father, you who spend so much time around that red snake Pyrates and his deviltry, if you can't feel what's happening, what in Aden's name are you saying? the king demanded. What do you know? He struck his hand against his thigh with a crack. Nothing. Pyrates is my able servant. He will do for me what no one else can. He is a monster and a necromancer, the princess shouted. You are becoming his tool, father. What has happened to you? You have changed. 
Miriamel made an anguished sound, tried to, trying to bury her face in her long blue veil, then leaped up to dash past on velvet-slippered feet into her bedchamber. A moment later, she had pushed the heavy door closed behind her. Damn all children, Elias swore. Girl, he shouted, striding to the door. You understand nothing. You know nothing about what the king is called on to do. And you have no right to be disobedient. I have no son. I have no heir. There are ambitious men all around me, and I need Fengbald. You will not thwart me. He stood for a long moment, but there was no reply. He struck the heel of his hand against the door, and the timber shuddered. Miriam L., open the door. Only silence answered him. Daughter, he said at last, leaning his head forward until it touched the unyielding wood, only bear me a grandson, and I will give you merriment. I will see that Fangball does not hinder your going. You may spend the rest of your life staring at the ocean. He brought up his hand and wiped something from his face. I do not like to look at the ocean myself. It makes me think of your mother. One more time he struck the door. The echo bloomed and died. I love you, Mary, the king said softly. The turret at the corner of the western wall had taken the first bite out of the afternoon sun. Another pebble rattled down the cistern, following a hundred of its fellows into oblivion. I'm hungry, Simon decided. It would not be a bad idea, he reflected, to wander over to the pantry and beg something to eat from Judith. The evening meal would not be served for at least an hour, and he was uncomfortably aware that he hadn't had a bite since early morning. The one problem was that Rachel and her crew were cleaning out the long refectory hallway and chambers alongside the dining hall, the latest battle in Rachel's strenuous spring campaign. It would certainly be better, if possible, to circumvent the dragon and any words she might have to offer on the subject of begging food before supper. After a moment's consideration, during which time he sent three more stones tick-tack ticking down the well, Simon decided it would be safer to go under the dragon than around her. The refectory hall took up the entire length of the upper story along the seawall of the castle's central keep. It would take a very long time to go all the way around by the chancellery to come at the kitchen on the far side. No, the storage rooms were the only route. He took a chance on a quick dash from the commons yard across the western portico of the refectory and made it through unobserved. A whiff of soapy water and the distant slosh of mops hastened his steps as he ducked into the darkened lower floor and the rooms of stored goods that took up most of the area below the dining halls. Since this floor was a good six or seven ells below the top of the inner bailey walls, only the faintest gleam of reflected light made its way in through the windows. The deep shadows reassured Simon. Because of many combustibles, torches were almost never brought down to these rooms. There was little chance he would be discovered. In the large central chamber, great piles of iron-banded casks and butts were stacked to the ceiling, a murky landscape of rounded towers and close-hemmed passages. Anything might be stored in these barrels. Dried vegetables, cheeses, bolts of fabric from years long past, even suits of armor like shining fish in casks of midnight dark oil. The temptation to open some and see what treasures lay hidden privily inside was very strong, but Simon had no pry bar to unlid the heavy, tight-nailed barrels. Neither did he dare make too much noise with the dragon and her legions dusting and polishing away just above like the charwomen of the damned. Midway across the long shadowed room, threading his way between barrel tower, excuse me, midway across the long shadowed room, threading his way between barrel towers that leaned like cathedral buttresses, Simon nearly fell down a hole into darkness. 
Dancing back in heart-thumping surprise, he quickly saw that rather than a mere hole, it was a hatchway that gaped in the floor before him, its door flung open and back. With care, he could step around it, despite the narrowness of the path. But why was it open? Obviously, heavy hatch doors did not swing open unaided. Doubtless, one of the housekeepers had brought something up from the storeroom farther below and been unable to both manage the burden and close the door. With only an instant, with only an instant's hesitation, Simon scrambled down the ladder into the hatchway. Who could say what strange, exciting things might be hiding in the room below? The space beneath was darker than the room above, and at first he could see nothing at all. His groping foot encountered something below him. As he gingerly lowered his weight, it took on the, solid, the solidity of familiar board flooring. When he took the other foot off the ladder, however, it met no resistance at all. Only his tight grip on the ladder rung kept him from toppling off balance. There was still open space immediately below the ladder, another hatchway to a floor even further below. He maneuvered his swinging foot until it found the lip of the lower hatch, then moved off onto the security of this middle room's floor. The hatch door above him was a gray square in the wall of darkness. By its faint light, he saw with disappointment that this area was little more than a closet. The roof was far lower than that of the upper room, and the walls extended back only a few arms' length from where he stood. This small room was crowded to the rafters with barrels and sacks, with only a small aisle that reached back to the far wall separating the leaning dry goods. As he surveyed the closet with disinterest, a board creaked somewhere, and he heard the measured sound of footsteps in the blackness below him. Oh, God's pain, who's that? And what have I done now? How stupid of him not to think that the hatchway might be open because someone was still down in the rooms below. He had done it again. Silently cursing himself for an idiot, he slid into the narrow aisle between the packed goods. The footfalls below approached the ladder. Simon wedged himself back off the aisle into a space between two musty plain cloth sacks that smelled and felt like they might be full of old linen. Realizing that he would still be visible to anyone who stepped away from the hatch and into the pathway, he sank into a half-crouch, resting his weight carefully on an oak-ribbed trunk. The steps halted, and the ladder began to creak as someone climbed up. He held his breath. He had no idea why he was suddenly so frightened. If he was caught, it would only mean more punishment, more of Rachel's hard looks and peppery remarks. Why, then, did he feel like a rabbit, scented by hounds? The sound of climbing continued, and for the moment it seemed that whoever it was would continue up to the large room above, until the steady creaking stopped. The silence sang in Simon's ears. There was a creak, then another, but he realized with a heavy feeling in his stomach that the noises were coming back down. A muffled bump as the unseen figure stepped off the ladder onto the floor of the closet, and again there was silence, but this time the very stillness seemed to throb. The slow tread moved closer down the slender aisle until it halted directly across from Simon's hastily chosen hiding place. In the dim light he could see pointed black boots, almost close enough to touch. Above hung the black-trimmed hem of a scarlet robe. It was Pyrates. Simon crouched back among the dry goods and prayed that Adon would stop his heart, which seemed to be beating like thunder. He felt his gaze drawn upward, against his will until he stared out between the sagging shoulders of the sacks that hid him. Through the narrow gap he could see the alchemist's bleak face, and for a moment it seemed that Pyrates looked straight at him, and he nearly squealed in terror. An instant later he saw it was not so. 
The red priest's shadow-shrouded eyes were focused on the wall above Simon's head. He was listening. Come out. Pryrades' lips had not moved, but Simon heard the voice as plainly as if it had whispered in his ear. Come out now. The voice was firm, but reasonable. Simon found himself ashamed at his conduct. There was nothing to fear. It was childish foolishness to crouch here in the dark when he could stand up and reveal himself, admit the little joke he had played, but still, where are you? Show yourself. Just as the calm voice in his ear had finally convinced him that nothing would be simpler than to stand and speak, he was reaching for the sacks to help himself up. Pryrades' black eyes swept for a scant moment across the dark crack through which Simon peered, and the glancing touch killed any thought of rising as a sudden frost shrivels a rose blossom. Pryrates' gaze touched Simon's hidden eyes and a door opened in the boy's heart. The shadow of destruction filled that doorway. This was death. Simon knew it. He felt the cold crumble of grave soil beneath his scraping fingers, the weight of dark, moist earth in his mouth and eyes. There were no more words now, no dispassionate voice in his head, only a pull an untouchable something that was dragging him forward by fractions of inches. A worm of ice clasped itself around his heart as he fought. This was death waiting, his death. If he made a sound, the merest tremble or gasp, he would never see the sun again. He shut his eyes so tightly that his temples ached. He locked teeth and tongue against the straining need for breath. The silence hissed and pounded. The pull strengthened. Simon felt as though he were sinking slowly down into the crushing depths of the sea. A sudden yow was followed by Pryrates' startled curse. The intangible throttling grip was gone. Simon's eyes popped open in time to see a sleek gray shape skitter past leap over Pryrades' boots and streak to the hatchway, where it bounded down into darkness. The priest's surprised laughter scraped out, echoing dully in the cluttered room. A cat? After a pause of half a dozen heartbeats, the black boots turned away and moved back up the aisle. In a moment, Simon heard the ladder thongs squeaking, he continued to sit rigidly, his breathing shallow, all of his senses alarmed. Chill sweat was running into his eyes, but he did not lift his hand to wipe it away. Not yet. At last, after many minutes had passed and the latter sounds had faded, Simon rose from the sheltering sacks, balancing on weak, trembling legs. Praise, you Cyrus, and bless that little gray scattercat. But what to do? He had heard the upper hatchway close and the sound of booted footfalls on the floor overhead, but that did not mean that Pryrates had gone very far. It would be a risk even to lift the heavy door and look. If the priest were still in the storeroom, the chances were good that he would hear. How could he get out? He knew he should just stay where he was, waiting in the dark. Even if the alchemist were in the upper room now, eventually he must finish his business and depart. This seemed by far the safest plan, but part of Simon's nature rebelled. It was one thing to be frightened, and Pryrates frightened him witless. It was another thing to spend the whole evening locked in a dark closet and suffer the attendant punishments, when the priest was almost certainly on his way back to his eyrie in Yeldon's tower. Besides, I, I don't think he really could have made me come out, could he? Likely I was just scared nearly to death. The memory of the broken-backed dog rose in his mind. He gagged and spent long moments breathing deeply. And what of the cat who had saved him from being caught? Caught? 
The image of Pryrates' pit-black eyes would not leave him. They were no fear fantasy. Where had the cat gone? If it had jumped down to the lower floor, it was doubtless trapped and would never find its way back without Simon's assistance. That was a debt of honor. As he moved quietly forward, he could see a dim glow from the doorway in the floor. Was there a torch lit down there? Or perhaps there was some other way out, a doorway opening into one of the lower baileys? After a few moments of listening silently at the open hatchway, making sure that no one would surprise him this time, Simon stepped cautiously onto the ladder and began to climb down. A breath of cold air ruffled his tunic and goose-bumped his arms. He bit the inside of his lip and hesitated, then continued. Instead of being halted by another landing directly below, Simon's careful descent continued for some moments. At first, the only light rose from below him, as though he were climbing down some sort of bottleneck. At last, the illumination became more general, and soon after that, his downward groping exploration met with resistance. By the way, just to interject a note, I'm looking at the time. This may take me a couple of minutes past, but I'm going to finish this chapter, so don't be alarmed if I go a few minutes past the top of the hour. A breath of cold air ruffled his tunic and goosebumped his arms. He bit the inside of his lip and hesitated, then continued. Instead of being halted by another landing directly below, Simon's careful descent continued for some moments. At first, the only light rose from below him, as though he were climbing down into some sort of bottleneck. At last, the illumination became more general, and soon after that, his downward groping exploration met with resistance. He touched wood with his toes to one side of the ladder. He had found the floor. Stepping down, he saw that there was no further passageway below, that the bottom rung of the ladder rested here. The only source of light in the chamber, and with the topmost hatchway now closed, the only source of illumination at all, was a strange glowing rectangle that shone against the far wall, a misty door painted on the wall in fitful yellowish light. Simon superstitiously made the sign of the tree as he looked around. The rest of the room contained only a broken quintain and a few other pieces of discarded jousting furniture. Although the room's elongated shadows left many corners obscure, Simon could see nothing that would interest a man like Pryrates. He moved toward the gleaming design on the wall with hands extended, five-fingered silhouettes outlined in amber. The glowing rectangle flared suddenly, then quickly faded, dropping a shroud of absolute black over all. Simon was alone in darkness. There was no sound except for that of his own blood booming in his ears like a distant ocean. He took a cautious step forward. The sound of his shoe scraping the floor filled the emptiness for a moment. He took another step and then one more. His outstretched fingers felt cold stone. And something else. Strange, faint lines of warmth. He slumped to his knees beside the wall. Now I know what it's like to be at the bottom of a well. I only hope no one starts pitching stones down at me. As he sat, pondering what he should do next, he heard a faint whisper of movement. Something struck him in the chest and he gave a shout of surprise. At his cry, the touch was gone, but it returned a moment later. Something was butting gently at his tunic and purring. Cat, he whispered. You saved me, you know, he thought. Simon rubbed at the invisible shape. Slow down there. It's hard to tell which end is which when you squirm around so. That's right, you saved me, and I'm going to get you out of this hole you've gotten into. Of course, I've gotten myself into the same hole, Simon said aloud. He picked the furry shape up and lifted it into his tunic. The cat's purring took a deeper note as it settled against his warm stomach. I know what that glowing thing was, he whispered. A door, a magic door. 
It was also Priorates' magic door, and Morgenes would skin him for even going near it. But Simon felt a certain stubborn indignation. This was his castle, too, after all. And the storage rooms did not belong to any upstart priest, no matter how fearsome. In any case, if he went back up the ladder and Priorates was still there, well, even Simon's returning pride did not permit him to, to delude himself about what would happen then. So it was sit at the bottom of a pitch-black well all evening, or he flattened his palm on the wall, sliding it across the chill stones until he found the streaks of warmth again. He traced them with his fingers and found they corresponded roughly with the rectangular shape he had first seen. Laying his hands flat in the middle, he pushed, but met only the stolid resistance of unmortared stone. He pushed again as hard as he could. The cat stirred uneasily beneath his shirt. Again, nothing happened. As he leaned panting against the spot, he felt even the warm spots growing chill beneath his hands. A sudden vision of Priorates, the priest waiting in the dark overhead like a spider, a grin stretching his bony face, sent Simon's heart a-pounding. Oh, Elysia, mother of God, open, he murmured hopelessly, fear sweat making his palm slippery. Open! The stone became suddenly warm, then hot, forcing Simon to lean away. A thin golden line formed on the wall before him, running like a stream of molten metal along the horizontal until both ends dropped down and then ran back together. The door was there, shimmering, and Simon had only to lift his hand and touch it with a finger for the lines to grow brighter. Actual cracks became visible, running the length of the silhouette. He placed his fingers carefully in one edge and pulled. A stone door swung silently outward, spilling light into the room. It took a moment for his eyes to adjust to the wash of brilliance. Behind the door, a stone corridor sloped away and disappeared around a corner, carved directly on into the rough rock of the castle. A turk torch burned brightly in a sconce just inside. It was this that had dazzled him so. He climbed to his feet, the cat a comfortable weight inside his shirt. Would Priorates have left a torch burning if he didn't plan to return? And what was this strange passageway? Simon recalled Morgane saying something of old Scythi ruins beneath the castle. This was certainly old stonework, but crude and raw, completely unlike the polished delicacy of Green Angel Tower. He resolved to make a quick inspection. If the corridor led nowhere, he would have to climb the ladder after all. The coarse stone walls of the tunnel were damp. As Simon padded down the walkway, he could hear a dull booming sound through the very rock. I must be below the level of the Kinslaw. No wonder the stones, even the air, everything is so damp. As if to punctuate this thought, he felt water coming in at the seams of his shoes. Now the corridor turned again, continuing its downward slope. The dimming light from the entranceway torch was supplemented by some new source. As he turned, one last corner he came onto a leveled, widened floor that ended some ten paces away in a wall of craggy granite. Another torch guttered in its bracket there. Two dark holes loomed in the wall at his left. At the end, just beyond them, was what looked to be another door, seated almost flush with the corridor's end. Water splashed near his shoe tops as he moved forward. The first two spaces seemed to have once been chambers of some kind, cells, most likely, but now splintered doors hung lazily off their hinges. The flickering torchlight revealed nothing inside but shadows. <coughs> A damp odor of decay hung in these untenanted holes, and he quickly passed them by to stand before the door at the end. The, hid the hidden cat pricked him with gentle claws as he examined the blank, heavy timbers in the wavering light. What might lie beyond? Another rotting chamber or a corridor leading still farther into the sea-bitten stone? 
Or was it perhaps Pryrates' secret treasure room, concealed from all spying eyes? Well, most spying eyes. Midway up the door was fixed a plate of metal. Simon could not tell if it was a latch or a peephole cover. When he tried it, the rusty metal did not budge, and he came away with red flecks covering his fingers. Casting about, he saw a bit of broken hinge lying beside the doorway to his left. He picked it up and pried at the metal until, with a begrudging squeak, the plate tilted upward on a rust and salt-stiffened hinge. After a quick look up the corridor and a moment of silence, listening for footfalls, he leaned forward and put his eye to the hole. To his great surprise, there, were a, there was a handful of rushes burning in a wall, wall bracket in the chamber, but any heady and terrifying thought of having found Pryrates' secret hoard room was quickly dashed by the dank, straw-covered floor and bare walls. There was something at the back of the chamber, though, some dark bundle of shadow. A clanking noise pulled Simon around in surprise. Fear washed through him as he looked frantically about, expecting any moment to hear the thump of black boots in the corridor. The noise came again. Simon realized with astonishment that it sounded from the chamber beyond the door. Putting his eye cautiously back to the hole, he stared into the shadows. Something was moving at the back wall, a dark shape, and as it slowly swayed to one side, the harsh metallic sound echoed again in the small space. The shadow shape raised its head. Choking, Simon jumped back from the spy hole as though slapped across the face. In a whirling moment, he felt the firm earth totter beneath him, felt that he had turned over something familiar to find crawling corruption beneath. The chained thing that had stared out at him, the thing with the haunted eyes, was Prince Joshua. And that's the end of the chapter. We did run a bit over. Anyway, um, Jeremy wants to know if Simon actually used the art to open the door. Well, there's a question, and uh, we can talk about it maybe next time. But I have gone over my limit for reading time, and I know people have other things to do. So I will thank you at this point for joining me. I will be back, barring some strange happenstance that I cannot yet predict. I will be back next week for readings at the same time, the same Tad time, the same Tad channel. Um, I thank you for joining me. And um, I, I, if I did help anything with people who couldn't comment before, please let me know. If not, I will continue to look to see what it was. Meanwhile, thank you all so much for joining me. Be good to yourselves. That's very important. Be good to the people around you, especially your loved ones, obviously, but really everybody. And I will see you next week. And thank you. And peace to you all. Good night.